Good morning, how's everybody doing? Y'all doing all right? You still awake? Before we get started, can we please give another round of applause to Tia and all the organizers who made this event possible? Let's give it up. And there's one other person I want us to give it up to, and I believe this person would not be here today unless they understood this fact. The youth work is not just a job. It's not just a passion. It's a calling. So give it up for yourselves for understanding that and being here fully present today. Again, my name is Roberto Rivera, and I want to open up this talk entitled Hip Hope, Cultivating Hope in the Hip Hop Generation with a story. And this is a story of a young man named Carlos. And see, Carlos' story fits the story of so many young people that fall in the cracks of our education. See, when he was in elementary school, Carlos was told he was learning deficient. By middle school, his misdirected entrepreneurship skills got him kicked out. Some of y'all caught that. He later ran away from home, got arrested, went through drug rehab, and at the age of 14, Carlos tried to take his own life. Anybody know a Carlos? A young person struggling to find meaning and hope in their lives? But fortunately, that's not the end of Carlos' story. See, Carlos told me he realized he wasn't learning deficient, he just learned differently. And as he began to apply that learning difference, the school started to do really well eventually redirected his entrepreneurship skills, created his own community-based organization, was named one of the top young change agents in America by Search for Common Ground Coalition, and now this individual who was told he was LD is now pursuing his PhD in education. And I got a lot of stories I could tell, could tell you about David Rojas and many others, but this story is very personal to me because it's not just the story of any Carlos. This is the story of Roberto Carlos Rivera. This is my story. And I get a lot of people wondering how I went from being helpless, helpless and hopeless, to being helpful and hopeful. How I went from being a dope dealer to what I call myself today, man, I'm a hope dealer. I'm the resident hope dealer. We got any other hope dealers in the house? Make some noise. That's right, right there, right there. I see hope dealers everywhere. But it's no doubt that this transformation necessitated that I learn how to think critically and act creatively and use my social and emotional competencies to take my pain. How many of us know these young people got pain? But I took my pain and I learned to turn it into propane to transform myself and the world around me. But yo, I couldn't have done this on my own. I needed people in my life to journey with me. I needed people in my life like you who have what I call Michelangelo vision. You see, Michelangelo, the great artist and sculptor, as the story goes, was teaching some pupils and how to do some sculpting as well. I don't know if you're in after school university in Fresno or where exactly he was teaching the classes, but he gave them a big stone to work on, and they were working all day on this stone. And it looked like they were creating something out of the movie, like the blob or something. And so they came over to Mike, and my rendition is, they say, hey, yo, Mike, how you create something so beautiful out of something so ugly? How do you create something so priceless out of something so worthless? And Michelangelo said, nah, see, you don't understand. You got to have a relationship with the stone. It might take some days, some weeks, or even longer, but eventually that stone will reveal the beautiful sculpture within it. Then he says, my job is easy. I seek to only chip away at the rough pieces that have trapped the sculpture. And this is very pertinent to us who are in education, because we learn that the root word for education comes from the Latin term educare, which means to bring out that which is already there. So really, our purpose as educators is twofold. One is to have a relationship with our youth, to see that beauty and brilliance, and two is to create an experience so they can see that beauty and brilliance for themselves. But how many of us know that most of society is framing our young people as being the stone instead of the sculpture? This is evidenced by the fact that we have about a 35% dropout rate across our nation, which escalates to 70% in some urban contexts. 
We know that young people who drop out of high school are 10 times more likely to be incarcerated than youth who graduate. We have 2.5 million people locked up, and we know a disproportionate number of these folks are our young men of color. But as hope dealers, we know these young people are not supposed to be criminals. They're supposed to be agents of change. They're not supposed to be drug dealers. They're supposed to be business leaders. They're not supposed to be gang bangers. They're supposed to be community organizers. And so myself being a hope dealer, see, I believe that this experience wasn't just true to me, but could be true for a lot of Carloses in this generation. So I teamed up with some researchers and some artists Remixing my experience with empirical research and social emotional learning, positive youth development, and hip hop based education. Led by the question of how do we cultivate hope in the hip hop generation, we were led, literally led to the research and work of Paulo Freire, Brazilian educator who defines hope as acknowledging our concrete realities and actively working towards the dreams of what is still possible. We realized that this critical, creative, and socially, emotionally competent hope was not something we could school in our youth, but something that we needed to educare and bring out. So we thought, what better way to engage this generation than using hip hop, the very culture that they find themselves immersed in. So we started using hip hop culture, not to be confused with hip hop industry, as a vehicle to cultivate hope. We call this whole pedagogy and framework hip hope. Now when I say hip, I want you to say hope. Say hip. Hope. Hip. Hope. Now when I say hip, then you say hope. Say hip. Hope. Hip. Hope. And people are like, hip hope. That kind of sounds sort of fluffy or funny or whatever. But the outcomes have been astonishing. We've seen GPAs go up a full point in a matter of weeks. One alternative school where they have really high standards, so you have to be kicked out of two other schools just to be admitted into this school. I mean, it's really competitive. <laughs> After one year of implementing these ideas, had their first ever 100% graduation rate. We worked with the Y. How many folks here from the Y? Make some noise. We worked with the Y in Cincinnati in 28 different schools. And after three years of implementing these ideas, they were named the top after school association in the nation for the why. We did third party research looking at increases in hope, leadership, decreases in emotional distress. But the thing that I get most excited about is the critical service learning projects. Young people doing block parties, bringing different gang territories together. Young people doing town hall meetings, getting politicians, putting them on the spot, in the spotlight. Uh, will you fund our program for the next year now that you're here? And getting them to agree to funding the programs. Young people creating books, creating apps. So what I want to do real quick is just share a case study of when we first got started with Hip Hope. And to give a little context, I've been doing work in out of school time for 17 years. I was a program director when I was 19 years old. And so, how many people here have been uh, doing youth work for 10 years, 15 years, 20 plus years? Can we give it up for the folks here who've been doing a lot of good work? So doing this arts-based educational programming, we went from doing workshops, to concerts, to festivals, to full-blown hip-hop theatrical productions. And we were amazed to see young people sharing stages with Congress people, opening up for international hip hop acts. On one, one level, they're thriving, but on the other level in school, they said they felt like complete failures. They were telling us that they were being singled out and disproportionately disciplined, made to feel like criminals. So we began to ask ourselves, what if we could take this framework and begin to infiltrate some of the school day as well? So for us, crisis has always been a precursor for opportunity. And so as we're trying to court this particular district, a lot of articles were coming out saying that there was too much violence in the schools and uh, gang recruitment was going up and kids were getting caught smoking weed. Does it sound like anybody's school district? I'm just curious. So we went to the superintendent. We said, we have this new idea. We want to pilot it out. He said, we tried every intervention under the sun. We might as well try this hip hopity stuff here. So with his blessing, he sent us into what was deemed the worst school in the district. 
Now we met with the principals and were able to ascertain that about 90% of the issues came from four classes. Looking more deeply, we saw this is where they are warehousing their brown and black youth with every label under the sun, from LD to ADD to ADHD to EBD to ODD to XYZ. Yes, some were probably even down with OPP. <laughs> but the last thing they needed was another intervention. And they've been exposed to too much. They didn't need prevention. What they needed was something new. What they needed was invention to experience themselves in a new way. So we took a step back and we decided to do an all school assembly. We brought in some artists to perform. I spoke and we announced this hip hop leadership program was rolling out for a few elite students. This was on a Friday. On a Monday we show up in the four classes and they could not believe that we chose them. But we said you all have tremendous influence. We want you to use that influence for good. You all have sparks of passion. We want to help you find that spark and fan it into a flame. So we started coming in during a homeroom and supplementing that with after school uh, classes and workshops. And so getting young people to start thinking critically about the media. Raise your hand if you know young people need to think critically about the media. And a lot of them were in the production. So we said, why don't you learn how to sample consciousness? Sample from the example of people who have lived purposefully. Sample through the records of history. Don't try to mimic these folks. Remix these examples in a way that's authentic to who you are. We got them to start asking different questions. Instead of asking, am I smart? To start asking, how am I smart? Understanding that these young people break dancing and doing freestyle raps, and I don't know if they're quite as positive as the brother earlier today talking about go big or go home. Let's give another round of applause for him real quick. But understanding that these are manifestations of intelligence, and if we can get them to start soul blinging out of school time, that they could begin to transition and soul bling during school time as well. Helping the young people to realize that they have a voice, that they can share their stories in a relevant way. And in the sharing of these blue stories, develop their social and emotional competencies. So the critical service learning project that these youth did was to revitalize the talent show. How many of us have talent shows in some of our schools? So this had dwindled in recent years. And with the young people taking the lead, they brought together the parents, the community, created a platform for their peers to do skits. They did some poems. They even did a rap called Soul Bling. They went something like, it's not a new but an old thing. I'm working hard, man, trying to let my soul bling. I ain't concerned what your goal brings. I got a purpose in this more than trying to hold things. You serving them death, I'm serving them life. You serving them wrong, I'm serving them right. You either part of the problem or the solution. So let's solve our problems and start a movement. <laughs> and these young people got a standing ovation. Teachers coming over to parents for the first time. I never realized that your son was so positive, so influential, so talented. But see, we live in a day and an age where it seems like Barack Obama could have came out of our campaign. Mr. Gary Moody could have came out of the campaign. But if we don't have any data, it seems like what we're doing doesn't even matter. Fortunate for us, we were able to partner with the school and get access to the school records. We saw the GPAs on average in the four classes went up half a point. Attendance improved. Behavior issues went down. And in the young men deemed the most at risk in the whole district, their GPAs went up a full point in a matter of 10 weeks. We brought this to the superintendent. And he declared a town hall meeting. He brought all the principals together, all the heads of staff. But the, the highlight was in our PowerPoint. We got some all right, PowerPoints. The highlight was our youth who wanted to give testimony. One young man said, my brother is in a gang. And I was planning to join that gang. But I'm not going to do that anymore because I realize I have a dream. And I can see how school is going to help me fulfill that dream. Another young man said, I used to get into a lot of fights. I got a lot of haters. But I realize I want to leave a legacy. I want my family to have a good name. I want to serve my community. So I'm not going to let these haters hold me back anymore. Another young man said, yeah, I used to smoke weed every day after school, lots of blunts. But I don't do that anymore. By now the chief of staff is like, okay, is this for real? Like what's going on here? So she starts to probe a little bit. She says, so what's different now? He says, well now I have hope. 
well, what kind of hope is this, she says. Is this a hope you have today and it's gone tomorrow? He looks her dead in the eye. He says, this is a hope I'm going to have for the rest of my life. These young people went on and getting on the honor roll and became the agents of change to powerfully transform the culture and climate of that school forever. Hip Hope went school-wide, district-wide, and now we're doing this work internationally. So what I want to do real quick is analyze this case, through, case study through the research lens of the Search Institute's framework for thriving from the late, great Peter Benson. Anybody know the work of Peter Benson? God bless his soul. Peter Benson came up with this work saying that young people need three things in order to thrive. They need to have relationships with adults other than parents. Raise your hand if you've heard this before. They need to realize that they have a spark of passion, something that they're good at. They need to have an opportunity to have a voice, to contribute in the context in which they find themselves situated in. But in a sample of 5,000 youth represented of young people from throughout the nation, only 7% report having strength in all three areas. So that's 93% of youth in America who say that they don't feel like they're thriving. And so what I want to do is not only look at this case study through this lens, but reciprocally see how the case study can expand the lens. So we can flip the script and see maybe 70, 80, or even 90% of our youth in the U.S. begin to thrive. Y'all ready for this? Y'all want to go deeper, say deeper. Y'all want to go higher, say higher. So looking at relationships, it's no doubt that we need to have relationships. Youth need relationships with someone other than a parent, especially during adolescence. But what we would contend is that these relationships need to be established with a critical awareness of reality. See, our young people are potentially going to inherit one of two different narratives. One narrative that says that they're part of the problem. And they inherit this from society and the media more specifically. This is evidenced by the fact that youth criminality has actually decreased 40% since the crack epidemic in the mid-1990s. But the betrayal of youth as criminals has increased over 600% through the images and mass media. So young people are also being framed as the solution when it comes to history. And I'm not talking about the history books that they make in Texas. No offense to my Texas folks. But I'm talking about the people's history. The history that says that young people have been at the forefront of every major movement in the last 50 years. From civil rights to South Africa and the ending of apartheid, to Brazil and the adoption of the UN's rights of a child, to the overthrowing of Mubarak in Egypt, to Ferguson. What we came to believe is that young people who regain their history reclaim their ability to make history. And so within the case study, what we had to do is approach these young people not as being part of the problem, but being part of the solution. I want you to say this with me. You're not part of the problem, you're part of the solution. Like you mean it. You're not part of the problem, you're part of the solution. And so we had to baptize our own eyes in the waters of history to both verbally and non-verbally approach our young people as being part of the solution. What work do we need to do as a collective to both verbally and non-verbally let our young people know we see them this way? Secondly, is that we need to help young people find that spark. The research says that a majority of youth find that spark in the arts and athletics. Raise your hand if you know that to be true. What we came to understand is sometimes these sparks get lost and overlooked, especially when they're expressed in a culturally nuanced way. So some young people are into graffiti or breakdancing. In Chicago, that we do bopping now, freestyle rap. But these are actually manifestations of intelligence that we can build up in out-of-school time and encourage them to have a Carol Dweck growth mindset to use these muscles during the school day as well. What are some of the sparks that we're potentially overlooking in our youth? And how can we build a community that not only identifies these sparks, but fans them into a flame? Lastly, we need to help our young people to have a voice, to not just be able to say something, but to actually be heard. How many of us know there's a difference? And so what we came to understand is that young people expressing their voice in a relevant way allowed them to share their blue stories. We talked about that a little bit in the master class. 
But in the exchange of these stories, to begin to develop a critical consciousness, to understanding, okay, we not only have a story for our lives, but we as a collective can write a counter narrative of what is possible for our school. So in the case study, these young people realized that the root issue is that they had been branded as being full of deficiencies and being liabilities. By them revitalizing this talent show, they demonstrated that they were full of assets and that they were indeed agents of change. We believe this with all of our heart. No youth serving organization will ever reach its full potential without the consistent input of youth. How can we begin to infuse youth voice into the development of our programs, our plans of action, our policies? We've taken this to heart with Good Life to the point where some of our students, even one of our students who is here, is now working as a director of products for the organization. They're helping to develop our new iterations of the program. With the new partnership with J.P. Morgan Chase, we're digitalizing our whole curriculum, which we believe could transform youth development. This would never happen without having this co-creation with our youth. So in conclusion, how do we cultivate hope in the hip hop generation? One is we gotta build authentic relationship with our youth that has a critical awareness, that allows them to sample from history and remix in their own unique way. Two is that they need to realize they have a spark. And yes, sometimes these are expressed culturally in a nuanced way, they need to be able to get into that in a way that builds up themselves and their identities. Three, they have a voice. And the expression of these voices in a relevant way can not only be done in a way that cultivates their competencies, but also allows them to build a critical consciousness that can begin to shift reality. How many of us know our young people are not waiting for Superman to come save them? They're waiting for hope dealers to journey with them in a reciprocally transformative fashion that not only liberates them, but liberates and energizes us. And I believe that this co-creation can begin to transform this thing called education. This is our moment that we've been waiting for. This is our time to be boosted up, to bring these strategies back home. I believe there's a whole generation of Carloses who are waiting to be engaged in this way. This is the opportunity that is before us this is the movement of hip hope. Thank you all so much for having me.